5 million in 10 years. Now, have we had 5 million more houses to accommodate that? Have we had the infrastructure to build additional electricity, uh, the framework that electricity works on, water? Have we got the food capability to bring it in? Coming up on British Thought Leaders, I sit down with Stephen Wolfe, director of the Centre for Migration and Economic Prosperity. Stephen says the real impact of high immigration is seldom felt by its supporters. That selfishness has to stop. You need to think about the people in the rest of the country. And that needs taking difficult decisions. And Suela Braverman has been very brave in raising the issue to the intelligentsia about the failings of the United Nations Refugee Convention. He says the elitist approach to immigration is driving a wedge through Britain. There is a big cultural divide now between the very wealthy or the medium wealthy who say we see a benefit to mass immigration and to those who have to suffer the consequences of large-scale migration. And that cultural divide is much stronger, much deeper, and I think it's a really nasty part of what is changing uh, Britain as a whole. I'm Lee Hall and this is British Thought Leaders. Stephen Wolfe, thank you for joining us on British Thought Leaders. My pleasure. Thank you for inviting me. It's very kind of you. So Ella Braverman warned British culture would disappear if immigration remains uncontrolled. Would you agree that the past 25 years immigration has been too much too quick? I think there's a number of points to raise from that question that you had. Too much too quick. What does that really mean? Does it mean that we've had too many uh, migrants from different countries, too many asylum seekers, too many illegal immigrants over a short period of time? Or does it just mean the whole diaspora and the implications of bringing people in, including their children? I think initially, when we were looking at the 1950s and the early 60s, there was clearly no too quick about it. There was a definite need for uh, workers to come into the country, and that was clear because of the volume of people that had died uh, during the course of the Second World War and the need to expand the British economy uh, as a consequence of that. Where we really started to see m incredible differences in the volume of people coming into the United Kingdom was really the onset of the Labour Party under Tony Blair. So much so that in 2001 we had 103,000 asylum applicants just in one year. And of course we also had the issue of our membership of the European Union allowing so many uh, European Union citizens to join that famous phrase that only a few thousand would come by. Uh, I think it was Dust Dustman and Jonathan Porters who advised the Labour Party and it turned out to be millions. So much so that last year I think there was 6.2 million visas granted under the European scheme that enables people to remain after Brexit. So if you look at that, I would say it's in the past 20 to 40 years where we've seen huge differences, but that's uh, elevated itself into a really increasing volume that's now impacting significantly the nation state. And it's ex impacting us in terms of the housing, uh, the need to house people, it's impacting uh, social fabric, uh, hospitals, schools, infrastructure, even as basic as water and electricity, because we now have a population growth that is not capable of being dealt with by this government, and nor will it be able to be dealt with easily by the next. So what kind of figures are we seeing generally now in terms of legal and illegal immigration? Do we effectively have open borders? Um, to an extent, we do. Um, certainly our research showed as the Centre for Migration and Economic Prosperity when I was looking at the asylum process, we have about 1.2 million people since the year of 2020. And of course, we have some big numbers that have come in over the past couple of years with uh, those from Ukraine. And also, we're really looking at potentially even bigger numbers from Hong Kong because we've given an effective open door to six or seven million people to be able to come. So far, we've not had uh, major impacts, but if you look at uh, a, a town like Warrington, Warrington has seen 20,000, 30,000 people from Hong Kong wishing to settle there. 
So you are expecting very large numbers. I, I think the big number that I would always like to focus on really is the size of the population growth of the United Kingdom in just 10 years. That's an increase of 5 million. 5 million in 10 years. Now, have we had 5 million more houses to accommodate that? Have we had the infrastructure to build additional electricity, uh, the framework that electricity works on, water? Have we got the food capability to bring it in? Is there any reason why we're importing more food from across the globe? Why are our roads filled with large articulated lorries? Because we're having to feed more people. And the, in England, not the United Kingdom, England is now the most dense country in Europe. So all of these points are significant to say that's about migration, both illegal and legal, the impact on our country. And where I believe it's really important to concentrate on is not the ethnicity of where people are coming from. They, there are going to be issues and questions about that, and I think that's a different. But it must be looked at just the sheer numbers and whether a country is capable of doing that. And what are we planning to do as a nation? Where do we see ourselves going in the future? How do we manage to achieve a kind of equitable lifestyle for people? Because all of this simply drives costs further and further away from people being able to have a decent life. It just increases costs and frustration for everybody when a population grows excessively without the rest of the economy following with it. The Home Secretary also said, without public consent, uh, immigration is illegitimate. I mean, what, what is the public consenting to? What's the British public's attitude towards immigration? I think she's right. Uh, if you look at a nation, uh, one of its most important elements of government is to actually protect its borders and protect those people living within the borders. And what that means is that m they must not face any uh, nasty surprises like the Russians invading Ukraine, for example, but also internally you must be able to feed them, make sure they're watered, make sure they have housing, health looked after. And that means a proper mandate to be able to spend and invest in public services. And as I said, when you increase a population into a nation, that puts pressures across all those spectrums. So the government must look at how to protect its own people. And when you look at the, the, the people of the United Kingdom, as a whole, they have been incredibly friendly and welcome to those across the globe. And that's a historical element. It doesn't really matter whether it's the Huguenots who came in small numbers, 20, 30,000 over a decade or so, to those coming across uh, from the Ukraine. We have a reputation of actually looking after human beings in a decent way. It doesn't mean there haven't been minorities who've disliked it, but as a whole, as a nation, we really warmly accept people from different countries because we look at them as human beings. We don't look at them as chattel. We don't look at them as a, as a tool or a, a piece of clothing. We consider them as vital components of our natural state where we want to be. And we say, do we want to be treated in the same way if we went to their country? And we'd hope that would be the case. We know it's not always the case. But there is a, a space when all governments have to consider is whether that generosity is being impinged too much. And what that means is how many people are coming here and the impact across the nation. And so what we've seen over the past, I would say, 20 years, but more so in the run-up to the 2014 European elections, was increasing polling that said we no longer wanted to see immigration at the levels that they were seeing then, and they didn't want to see abuse of the asylum system. Two different and distinct arguments being put forward. One, the very fairness of the British people. You should be able to apply from a different country to come here in a proper way, and if you are, are genuine an asylum seeker in need, then you're allowed to stay. But illegality we don't like. And secondly, we feel that the structure of our nation is changing. And it began, obviously, you look at uh, the northern cities and uh, some of the Midland uh, towns, and then, of course, it, it spread across to the eastern areas, particularly Lincolnshire, where you see, saw huge numbers of people from different countries coming in and changing the very structure of what they regarded as home for people. 
Now, some of it brought benefits. I mean, if you look at Manchester, you have the Curry Mile, where I was born, not far away from that. And of course, everybody likes to go out and have a curry, or now it's Turkish food, or then it's Somalian food, and now we see a lot of Chinese food being brought over, and increased Jap Japanese food is now becoming flavor of, of, of the month, so to speak. That is one thing where you see some benefits. But where you see a whole lot of people coming in from a different culture, in areas, as I saw with my home streets, literally dominated by people who dress differently, who don't speak the language, who don't seem to have the same level of respect, say, for something as simple as a hedge, which they cut down to drive a road, a path through for their car. So you diminish the community. People start to ask questions why. And that's reflected in the polling in 2016, and of course, why immigration became a serious issue in the European elections that helped vote uh, support uh, Nigel Farage's UKIP party. Of course, it then happened in the 2015 general election that drove through the Conservatives. You then had 2016 in terms of the referendum, where everybody was saying, we want you to take back control of our borders. And Boris relied on it extremely heavily in, during his campaign. People want control of immigration, not because they dislike the humanity of a different nation because they see the changes impacting their areas and everything else happening much more quickly than the class of people making the decisions. And one thing it's also driven uh, for me is a cultural divide in this nation. There is a big cultural divide now between the very wealthy or the medium wealthy who say we see a benefit to mass immigration and to those who have to suffer the consequences of large-scale migration. I would say it's a form of snobbery, because after all, if you're Rishi Sunak and you've gone to uh, Winchester College and you've then gone off to Oxford and then you've worked at Goldman Sachs and you're mixing with someone who's Chinese or someone from India or someone's from England or someone from Australia, you're part of an elitist class of individuals who talk on the same level. Wealth, what restaurant you go to, where do you go on holiday? You're not part of a country, you're part of your own country. This new elitist country that's always been there, but it's now so visible to everybody on the media and social media that they know exactly what you're doing. And they know exactly that when they talk in their dinner parties, they're demeaning those who, in, for example, voted Brexit because of the issues of immigration. And that cultural divide is much stronger, much deeper. And I think it's a really nasty part of what is changing uh, Britain as a whole. I, think, I feel in a way that's the kind of attitude that Victorian uh, mill owners had towards the people working in their factories. Those people who work in media or in uh, intellectual roles at universities, who had think tanks or non-governmental organizations, charities, work for the government at the senior civil service level. They're the new masters of the factories, and they don't like what the people who are working below them think or say. Do you think people are generally waking up to this kind of issue if there's a new elite at the top and, and they want to do something about it? I think the, the, we've always known there's elite at the top and, and in some ways there was an element of people thinking there was a benign elite. We look at the royal family and we can see them being genuinely interested in the people as a whole. We look at the Queen and the Queen Mother and you could see the sense from them of their sense of duty, the respect for their population and yet now you see this dispute between the two brothers with one supporting Black Lives Matter movement, which is openly political, or even indeed the king supporting uh, one aspect of environmental change. So you have a breakdown in that. When I was growing up, I, I became a barrister because of such was the kind of respect for law and order, you know, the, the police, the military that my grandmother and grandfather had. Grandmother from Ireland, grandfather, uh, my mother's grandfather from England, fought in the war. Huge amount of respect for those institutions. So they were delighted when I became a barrister. They thought it was one of the most honorable things that you could possibly do. And yet today, you have legal institutions very clearly driven between uh, left and right, where there are those within the legal community who believe that they should only represent certain classes of individual, where they get behind 
uh, for political reasons, the opponents to the Rwanda policy. And so what we're finding now with the enhancement of television, more channels, with the enhancement to communication of social media, despite its, uh, the trajectory of some of those in control to try and prevent messages being passed out, is that the public's eyes have been opened that there is a class of people now that is growing and despises them. And they despise them in a way that they just think that they know best and are not willing to understand the concerns or the consequences of their political or policy actions. And I find that deeply troubling. I find it deeply troubling if you can go to a dinner party and you can instantly see people despise, I don't know, say Trump or, or Nigel Farage. You may not like them as individuals, but they instantly say that anyone who voted for them are Trump or Nigel Farage and therefore espouse their policies. In Germany, you see the AFD. Now, I don't know a huge amount about the current AFD, but I do know that the population is beginning to vote for them in large numbers, and yet you'll see five political parties join together to stop them. You saw that during Brexit, where huge numbers of political animals create, joined with business leaders, uh, so-called think tanks and experts from across the globe to try and suppress a vote, but not because of the issue as a whole. It's because they felt those people just did not know what they were talking about. And how many politicians did we hear or speakers at the time say exactly that? So people's eyes are wide open. They completely see it. And there are challenges out there. Uh, there is friction. There is a, a, a nastiness in our discourse which shouldn't be there. I would like to have more elevated and intellectually based conversations with those people who oppose me at, at dinner parties, but you can't because there's, they are so virulent and often violent in their use of their language. And we've seen that from you know, Labour Party politicians. The deputy, um, the deputy leader of the Labour Party has, has, has called out conservatives so many times as scum, and yet that's not challenged in the same way. So until those people who feel that the, the people as a whole are, are not too ignorant or willing to engage in conversations, we're simply going to get worse and the people are going to have a more divided element in our society. It seems whenever the government tries to do anything about immigration, they hit various obstacles, whether it's a relationship with France or activist civil servants. Uh, what can the government actually do to make a difference at this point? Well, I, I, I've been impressed by a lot of what the government has tried to do, um, beginning with uh, Priti Patel, initially uh, not supported greatly by Boris Johnson until the death of the child in the, in the channel. And a very sad occurrence was something that I predicted because we were just ignoring the very facts that people smugglers were making so much money that they really didn't care how many people they were going to put into boats and they just recognised that the British government was going to take them in. So this was inevitable. And then I, I, I've seen Suela Braveman be faced by inordinately and excruciatingly painful uh, challenges to her as a woman, as, uh, as a black woman, as a woman of conservatism, um, calling her racist and xenophobic and all the nasty things that you expect if anyone wants to try and challenge that political ideology that we should have large-scale open-door migration and that there should be some control and control by government and control of our borders. So she's a very sensible speech that I think that she gave in America to highlight, in our view, some of the things that she was doing on a unilateral level, which I think they're right, you must have options to transfer and remove those who failed the asylum process from the United Kingdom, be that Rwanda or be that other countries, and I think there was probably a need to have other countries involved in that, or British protectorates where we should do, because that's a real serious deterrent. Everybody knows it, they just oppose it, because it, it's a policy done by the Conservative Party. I think she's also important to say that there has to be bilateral relationships, working with France, when you deal with France, you're not just dealing with France in its own political scenario, which is uh, at the moment Macron versus the rise of Marie Le Pen, who has a truly strong option this time of potentially becoming uh, the president of France, but also those 
in Europe who are facing enormous challenges, and we've seen Borelli, we've seen some comments coming out from leaders of, of the European Union's own commission at the moment saying uh, things that they would never really say uh, five years ago, which we regard as untenable, that immigration should be controlled. It's going to bring down the European Union, for example. So the, Brit the, the UK government has to um, face down the legal challenges, which is one. It has to enact policies to remove people from across uh, the, the, the United Kingdom to other countries. I think there has to be a very much stronger position on housing. It's far too easy. I mean, if you're in the UN and you're in Africa, people live in tents. If you've got tented communities, it's not very nice up in, in, in Iran or indeed Pakistan. So an asylum seeker coming over here, why should they be having hotels? It might sound inhuman, particularly with the cold weather that we have, but there are, there are those I made jokingly that Prince Charles once said that we were inhumane for interacting with uh, the idea of Rwanda. Well, he has an estate in Scotland the size of Liverpool. Why don't we put them all there? You know, and if he likes it so much, that's perfectly fine. You know, but he won't because he is part of that whispering class of people who say migrants welcome but never welcome in my own home. Migrants welcome as long as it's in the poor area of Lincolnshire, as long as it's being paid for by the, the poorer taxpayers of Manchester or Liverpool, as long as we see the housing put into estates that are not ours or having to be put near our nice leafy walks where we go with a dock. Again, that class of kind of snobbishness and self-interest that they're not willing to spread the pain across, or, or across to themselves. So I think they're doing pretty well in, in, in front. Housing is the massive issue. But one of the key points that is a crux issue for them is the international order. I've called for an, over a couple of years for reform of the United Nations Refugee Convention to recognize what the World Bank and what the European Commission has said, 60% of all asylum seekers coming in now are economic migrants. There needs to be a change in the way that we look at uh, you know, the rules related to family reunion, the rules related to unaccompanied small children in the way that we identify who they are. We need to get on top of the fact that you know, recognized that 73% of all those claimed were not uh, claimed to be children when appealed against were shown not to be, right. with an average age of 23. Really? 23. I mean, of course, you can look really young in some areas and you might have had some problems, but you know, 23 arguing that you're 15 is unacceptable, and they do so because they know they can get, they can get to stay here. I think they need to work really hard on the localized issues of funding um, the border control to actually remove people. But the biggest obst obstacle to really this after removing people to Rwanda is the fact that we can't remove even those who are uh, deemed to be not acceptable under the asylum process. And we had about 15,000 last year and a similar number for the last 10 years. So we're looking over about 150,000 who shouldn't be here. Now, there are horror stories, as we've seen, of one or two of them who've gone off to commit murders. Most of them don't. As we know, the majority of them don't. But they're still not entitled to be here. And with Iran, Iraq, Afghanistan, Somalia, um, now coming up with India and China, and we have no return agreements with those countries to send people back who've been rejected. So what do we do with them? And that is why the people smugglers are working. Until you solve that issue about being able to remove those who are genuinely being refused asylum under our process or grant of protection, to use the technical term, uh, then the people smugglers will win and the numbers will never come down, which is why it's so vital for the government to find a mechanism like Rwanda to work, but in multi-thousands, not in a few hundred. You have to send out a strong message, as Australia did, as Denmark has done so, and indeed, in a slightly different way, Poland did on the borders with Belarus. The polls suggest we'll have a Labour government soon. What were your thoughts on Labour's recent uh, immigration plan? Farcical, sadly. Um, those involved in it, I understand that Stephen Kinnock was part of the team that were looking at it, are genuinely concerned about the issue and generally uh, work with the idea that they recognise there are big impacts on communities across the country. 
But within the Labour Party, there are a number of huge challenges uh, philosophically. There are those who recognise it's, it's damaging communities, but there are those who economically think, well, actually, we've got some major issues about productivity and people coming in, so let's just bring in as many as we can. Otherwise, we're not going to be able to get the growth that we promised the people in our election, and therefore, we'll seem to have failed. And they see that as the very lazy option of increasing GDP by just floating in lots more people. And of course, then there's a large group of, uh, of a community within the Labour Party who are of uh, ethnic backgrounds who, who want to have more because they see it as a way of uh, diluting the, the United Kingdom, perhaps as a whole, and not allowing conservatives who they deem to be white on the whole voting for conservatism. This is part of policy of destroying conservatism. But his ideas that he put forward were laughed at not only by the European Union. Clearly, his idea that we would try and join some form of friendly uh, legal arrangement, just as we did with Dub Dublin 1, 2 or 3 with, uh, as pre-Brexit, and that we'd be able to send people back. We sent about 3,000 back over the time, and yet we ex accepted uh, nearly 100% more than that. No, was it? No, sorry, 1,000% more than that in that period of time. Nonsense numbers. We'd be sending out much less. Secondly, he feels that that would actually stop the people smugglers. Well, as I said, 15,000 were rejected, and they're still sending them over. So how many does he expect to have? 20,000? Well, this year we're going to have about 80,000 again. Less on the boats, but they're still coming in on the backs of lorries in through planes. And so... His ideas are farcical to think that he's going to be able to stop it. The second thing that is really noxious is the idea that he wants to bring the numbers down of those in the, in the process. Now, Rishi Sunak is already doing that, and he's doing that by increasing the numbers of people being granted, granted protection. Now, when you make a claim for asylum, you can go be granted protection, i.e. the right to remain in this country, under three categories. One is that you are a refugee under the asylum process. They call that asylum. Two, they call it ECHR, or EU Convention Rights, and that's very minuscule. It's about 3 or 4%. But about 70% of all decisions to allow people to come into the United Kingdom and stay here are not under those two legal frameworks that we have to fall within. It's discretionary. Right. It's what we deem in our rules, created by our governments and our civil servants to say somebody should stay here. Is it because uh, I'm gay in a village in Africa and I'm, I'm unhappy there about the way that I'm being treated in that country and therefore I come for them? Suela Braverman referred to that. That's only about three, four, maybe five percent of the numbers. Is it because I'm a woman and I feel that I shouldn't be able to stay in Iran or Iraq because of the way they treat it? Is it because of health reasons? that I can get medical treatment in the UK that will save my life or at least make my life better than it would do. All of those are reasons that we're granting people to stay here, not because they're fleeing fear or persecution. It's because it's better to come here, and of course, that is the largest scale. And if you bring the Labour Party in, I can guarantee that the numbers of 103,000 will escalate massively that you saw under Tony Blair under Keir Starmer, who in this particular debate is Blair too. So the, the, the standards for seeking asylum are just too low. I think like technically most of Afghanistan could claim asylum here. I, I think really, you know, I, I, I wondered about that number that um, Swela Braverman used yesterday in her speech, about 780 million. Well, I can't see why it can't be one or two billion, quite frankly. Mm -hmm. Because generally, the way that you look at most countries in the world, uh, the elites in those countries, be they China, are very small. The middle class is growing. But if you look across the whole of Africa, if you look across the whole of South America, if you look across India and Pakistan and Sri Lanka, and indeed, if you look at the Middle East, the vast majority of people are in the depths of enormous poverty and have very little opportunity to become the leader of their country become a professor in their university, become a lawyer in their legal institutions. The chances of a working class man or woman in any of those countries are entirely limited. It's almost impossible. Even in nations such as France, which I've seen, it's incredibly difficult for someone from a working class background to become a lawyer in their country at a level where you'd see them. In this country, we're tremendously successful at it. 
You are in Canada, you are in the United States, you are in Australia and in New Zealand. To an extent, you are in perhaps Holland and Belgium. But Spain, Greece, you almost have to be institutionalized within families that are wealthy enough to be able to do that. So if you think about the opportunities across the globe for people to be incredibly successful going from the lower levels to the top levels of that nation, why do you not think that they look at this country with eyes wide open and dreams aghast? They are thinking, this is my chance. That's why they want to come here. And I do not blame them for wanting to do that, would you? If it was my daughter or my son, I'd want them to go anywhere to be successful. But that does not mean they have a right to come here. It does not mean that legally they have a right. There might be a moral opportunity, but what do you do if you say we're going to take one billion people in? Where do they live? How do we, does our country implode because of that volume of numbers? And absolutely it would. I, I was uh, reading um, recently an interesting extract in Sapiens um, by, about Constantinople and the Holy Roman Empire, the Second Holy Roman Empire, just as the hordes of the eastern uh, 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 regions were becoming under control of dictators and people were murdering those in the east and they started coming to the walls on the land of uh, Constantinople. And initially there was pushback. They said, no, we're not going to allow these refugees to come in because it might dilute the area or it might uh, be problematical with food and being able to have scarcer resources, not organized in the way that we do in the modern world. Eventually they did. But after they did so, history shows that those same hordes then helped to bring down and destroy that part of the governments that enabled them to come in the first place. They bit the hand that fed them. Now, would I say to everybody in Africa if they came over to the United Kingdom they would bite the hands that feed them? No, not necessarily. But what I would say is that the modern world is not capable of being able to organize ourselves to be able to feed, house, water, and look after people in this country from the rest of the world. What we must do is try and enable those countries to be successful in their own way. We have to break down some of the ways that we have organized the world since 1945 in finances and in trade, in international agreements, in the way that we've propped up some of these very dictators under the, the, the moral name of democracy because there are Democrats, not the opposing Democrats. And so I think we need to look at that as an existential issue rather than look at the, the, the issues in our country of opening the doors. And that's where the failure of those on the left or those who regard themselves as liberal are. Again, I go back to them. How many of them are putting them in their houses? And how many of them are leaving them elsewhere? It's quite nice for you to be able to go off on holiday in these countries, knowing you can come back to your, your lovely home or you're being paid for by a taxpayer, because you've got a civil service job with a nice pension, and you live somewhere in the countryside that is not impacted by that. That selfishness has to stop. You need to think about the people in the rest of the country. And that means taking difficult decisions. And Suela Braverman has been very brave in raising the issue to the intelligentsia about the failings of the United Nations Refugee Convention and why it needs to be changed to make it fit for purpose for where we are now. Stopping the small boats was one of Rishi Sunak's five promises, although he, he didn't fulfil it. And we saw Giorgio Meloni get elected in Italy on similar promises, and there have been record surges in Italy since. France has a similar story. Why do these elected leaders, uh, why are they not able to fulfil the promises on immigration? What is it that's blocking them? I, I think uh, Suela Braverman raised two very fundamental and important points in her speech. Why are we not changing the UN Refugee Convention to fit modern times? It's because of inertia. It's too difficult or maybe very complicated uh, to do so because there isn't just the people who want to take a grip on it. And if you're trying to deal with so many countries, there won't be that agreement so easily. And secondly, no one wants to sit at that dinner table and be called the racist by the most voluminous person on the other side. They don't want to be called a xenophobic or illiberal or unkind or anti-human. All of these is what most of the leaders of our, our nation states have to face 
when they go home at the weekend and see their constituents or when they're in, in, invited to different events. And, and, and that is the biggest difficulty because morally they don't have the strength inside themselves to raise the challenging points at these events or at the dinner parties or at social events. They're just It's much easier for a human just to cower and say yes and no and just ignore the issues and just carry on in the hope that somebody else eventually one day would solve that problem. But in the, uh, the West, we also have very strong institutions who utilize the opposition to control of immigration, or whether it's legal or in terms of numbers, because it suits them on a political level too, to try and demean or diminish the Conservative Party. Let's paint them as evil. Let's paint anyone who votes the Conservative Party evil. That's part of a very strong cultural change that we've had over the past 20 years. Don't date a Conservative. You know, don't go out with them. Don't employ a Conservative. I know ha so many people now who are Conservatives don't even mention their politics because they know they won't get a job or they won't get uh, you know, a, a kind of promotion based on it. They keep quiet. And so that is a really important part of what's happening. So you see the trade unions backing opposition to Rwanda. You see huge numbers of charities, hundreds of them across the country, all funded by local government who keep the challenges going. And that turns into one final point that I think is quite insidious, really. There's actually a huge amount of money to be made in promoting those who oppose the government and oppose these policies. If you can get 30, 40, 50, 60,000 pounds for doing an average job for a charity, where you don't really have to do an enormous amount of work, just sit down and persuade people to stay in the country and this is how you can challenge them through, through the courts or through the Home Office process, that's an easy job. And then you can look moral and you can look fantastic at your own events and friends and people say, oh, what a good job you're doing, but actually you're doing nothing. You're not really doing a great deal. You're not being productive in society. In, in my view, you're looking good, and it's fantastic, and it's all smoke and mirrors. And as a consequence of that, there's money to be made in this. And whenever there's money to be made, people will actually jump on that bandwagon when they can see a job they don't have to really work very hard on to make a reasonable amount of money to exist where they've got secure tenure and they get the opposition to look good amongst all their friends. Fantastic for most of them. So it's like um, immigration is kind of this political football and it's used for point scoring and often nothing really gets done. Because any time anyone tries to do something, the other side will come in with a way to block and, and continue the game. I mean, how can we break this political game of immigration? I, I think it's incredibly difficult to break it because such is the need for um, the political parties on the left and, the, and those who regard themselves as centrists, like the Liberals, to demean the Conservative Party and anyone who supports conservatism uh, as being particularly evil or nasty, inhuman, then they're not willing to engage. They won't be willing to engage on the really difficult issues because they feel that they've got the moral high ground and we can paint our picture. And, the, and what's um, interminable for Conservatives is they have not yet being able to find the language to challenge them on the inhumanity. I think it was very clever by Suela Braverman yesterday to start challenging it in that intellectual scene. And immediately, of course, everyone in the UN said she was wrong and she's nasty and she's awful. And you could just see it from the same political commentators across the spectrum, what an awful human being she is and how great everybody who comes to this country contributes to society ignoring all the negatives as well. And if there is a negative, it's so minor that it's really inconsequential. So you're going to get that. And as a consequence of that overriding, what I call uh, category A, political uh, philosophy that's needed to demean the other side, there's not going to be any engagement on this particular issue. And so the division that we have in our country will get deeper and deeper. And the division is is generally being played out now where people are, who have been here, born here, lived here a long time, don't want to vote. You can see it in communities where they are insular, they don't want to integrate. 
uh, where you see that at schools that are differential. But also, you know, it's small in numbers, but as we saw where we saw two communities fighting in, in, in the streets of the United Kingdom over political issues in different countries. And that's only one of a number of examples I'd heard of at the smallest scale. So the division is acceptable. They want it. The politicians at the top want this division. They want to say there is, we hate division, but actually on both sides they're fomenting it. And in this is a particularly important one for the left to try and drive it through. But where the left is going to get caught out is the economics. They're going to find it incredibly difficult in the next 10 years to work through the fact that we're going to have another 2 or 3 million people come in in just 3 to 5 years, where we're going to have another 5 to 6 million people in the next 10 years. They will have to deal with that, and they won't have the money to do it. They just will not. And then you're going to face serious social breakdown in health, which we're already struggling in, in education, where we've been seeing schools being collapsing, but we need to build more. In transport and infrastructure, where are people going to move? How can they move? We've got an infrastructure that I know from listening to the leaders of Ofwat, how uh, infrastructure and water is collapsing, and the billions that we need to invest in that. If we're going to move in towards a greener energy where everybody's on batteries, what are we going to do in terms of the infrastructure hosting our electricity across the country? They can't spend that and spend it on an increasing population with increasing demands. They'll face those problems. They won't have any solutions, but they will have to face the social breakdown that is caused because of that. So I just want to ask you briefly about the uh, relationship with France. I mean, we've been paying money for a while now for, to do with illegal immigration. I mean, do you think that's achieved anything, and what do you think the relationship should be going forwards? Oh, well, I remember a cold, wet, wintry uh, December driving with my um, at that head of communications from Brussels to um, France when we put our first investment into a camp, the New Calais campus it was called then, um, and we, I think we put something like £80 million pounds to help them build this camp in France. And when we got there, the camp was empty. Uh, there was only one TV crew from BBC Kent, I think it was, uh, there was a, a small compound that looked like it was an old uh, Stalag 19 uh, wartime camp with three big tents. And there were three big tents in there. One tent was for medical, which was expected. Uh, one tent was just for charging mobile phones, and the other was an internet tent, you know, to provide them with interactivity for their com computers. And I thought to myself, this is quite mad. We're paying a huge amounts of money. And the idea then, the argument was that we're going to work with the France, we're going to stop people coming in, we'll be able to remove them. Six months later, I went with uh, the Daily Express. That camp was full, and across the road was a tented camp with multi-thousands of people. And as I, I played football in Keepy Uppy with uh, lots of lads from Africa who were coming over saying we want to come to England because we think race, racism exists in France and Germany and we don't want to go there, it was their, one of their reasons. So we failed then. And we failed then, just as we failed consistently to be able to get any real impact on this issue from the French, because the French don't really want to help. And why would you? For two particular reasons. If 80,000 people are going to leave France to go to the United Kingdom, that's 80,000 people we don't have to feed, water, look after, have problems with integration. And if the British government are going to give us money that actually funds effectively the whole of our border agency, not too bad, that's pretty good. And if we do allow them to stay, then we're going to allow parties such as Marie Le Pen to rise and potentially take over and ruin our cosy uh, uh, relationships that we have with the European Union. So that's why they won't want to do it. Had there been a modicum of success this year, I think there has, I won't say there won't, and one has to be fair, that the numbers coming across on the boats have been reduced. Uh, according to the Home Secretary, that is down to our relationships and increased technology and breaking down some of the people smugglers' networks. And if that's true, I welcome it. I think that's success. And we should be praiseworthy of success. I still believe at the end of this year we'll have about 60,000 people 
coming in. So stopping the boats hasn't happened. Some little changes have occurred, removing people back to Albania, very positive, slowing some of the boats coming down, tackling some of the people, smugglers, but whenever one is gone, and they're quickly replaced. The networks are very, very strong. We're not hitting the Mr. or Mrs. Biggs behind all of this. The networks of building boats in Turkey, is, through our agreements, are supposed to stop the factories making them there. The, the engines coming in from China, they're being built and, and constructed in Germany and then transported down through uh, Holland and Belgium all the way into to France. That hasn't completely stopped. So the people smugglers are still going to make somewhere in the region of three, four hundred million on their, uh, their profits this year alone. And not only that, they're going to make more in the years to come because it's all on a debt structure. They lend the money to the people arriving here who have to pay interest. And if they put them in housing, they have to pay interest in that housing. They're paying the accommodation to someone who's part of the network. So they've got a revenue stream in the future. It's like, it's like the, the Netflix or Amazon. You click every month and you know you're going to get someone go across and we get the money coming in. We're not challenging that. We're not using the international uh, financial framework to close these down in the same way that we d would do with money launders. We should treat them all as they are. Seriously nasty criminals preying on people at the worst. But I don't believe that the agreement with French, France will succeed because of those particular reasons. But France, along with the rest of the European Union, have now got enormous issues of their own. And I believe the comments that recently that immigration will bring down the EU is finally beginning to recognize that it's just too much for the European Union with an open border policy that they've got. They have mass failures of being able to control it despite a very strong anti-immigration party not just anti-illegal immigration, they're anti-immigration party in Italy. She's not stopped the boats. The message in Lampedusa when you saw those numbers coming across were put the Navy in and turn them all back. If she'd have done that, that would have sent a powerful message to those controlling the routes coming up through Africa. But she didn't. And as a result, many, many more are going to come in. Finally, what do you think we'll be in a, a year or two's time? <laughs> in a year or two time, uh, we will still be talking about this issue, except the numbers would have grown e even more significant in America. 3.25 million people crossed the border this year, but now the northern border is beginning to see thousands of people coming across. And you're seeing large numbers of towns in places like Guatemala and Nicaragua, which are being emptied. And there's going to be a pushback at some stage from some of these countries to how we deal with that. I think here we're going to have a, a, a very feisty general election that will become really, really nasty for lots of other reasons. Uh, I don't think immigration will be as par part of that as such. But we will be looking and facing some of the real social and economic consequences in the next two years. I don't think that they can hide from this any longer. And in the European Union, they are going to have massive issues. Maybe Marie Le Pen will win. Uh, maybe there'll be other victories and they, by parties that are, are, are pro um, the idea of controlling immigration in a much stronger fashion. Maybe the AFD will be successful in Germany. But whatever happens, this issue isn't going away. And until you come to a conclusion where you work out a modern framework for an international a regulatory system governed by an updated and amended UN Refugee Convention with the countries that are taking most of the uh, migrants, which includes Pakistan and Iran, by the way, um, have to face up to the fact that they can't do it any longer, um, then we will have a world where not 780 million people, but I do suspect over the next couple of years, four, five or six million people coming into Europe and as I've predicted into the, to the UK, I think we're going to find two to three million in just five years. Stephen Wolf, thank you for joining us on British Thought Leaders. Thank you.